Um, I'm super excited to welcome and uh, today Chushi, our product marketing manager here at SimGrep, and also Kyle, our expert on all things supply chain. to talk a little bit about how to shift left with the SimGrep AppSet platform. And with that, I'll pass it over to them to get started. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Um, my audio coming through all right. <clears throat> Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, you'll notice that throughout this webinar, there's not too many screenshots or um, videos of our platform or UI. Um, we're definitely going to try to show you guys everything in the context of how a developer will be seeing things. Um, so you can really understand how we're differentiated when it comes to the developer experience when fixing security issues. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so with SumGrip, everything kind of starts with our proprietary code scanning engine. Um, this extends the capabilities of our open source engine, which we are the active and uh, very proud maintainers of. And so our proprietary engine has super advanced capabilities like data flow analysis across files and functions. And it's super fast because it runs on source code only um, and it never requires any compile or build steps. Um, this is true even for compiled languages and even languages like C and C++ where source code can be very ambiguous um, before going through a preprocessor. Um, and so it's a rule-based engine. And so the other half of the equation here are the rules themselves. Uh, these just tell our engine the patterns or anti-patterns to look for in your source code. And this proprietary engine powers all three of our products. So that's SEMGRIP code for SAST, SEMGRIP supply chain for SCA, and SEMGRIP secrets for secret scanning. Um, at a high level, what this means is that while we do have three um, discrete products for different areas of AppSet coverage, we are internally able to really focus and channel our resources into improving the core analysis capabilities of one engine. And so one thing you'll notice with a lot of other SaaS vendors is they have platforms that are kind of like born out of the acquisition of a bunch of disparate tools. Um, but yeah, the gist of it is that we do SaaS, SCA, and secrets. Next slide, please. So before we get more into the platform, uh, I just wanted to take a step back and talk about the term itself, shifting left. So I know this webinar is called um, How to Shift Left with SemGrep, but to kind of like understand what shifting left means to us, uh, we kind of have to challenge the usefulness of the term overall, because um, I think one thing that everyone who works at SemGrep will tell you, um, or I, more specifically, I should say, everyone who works at SemGrep who regularly talks to AppSec teams and customers and prospects, um, is there are a ton of organizations that are using shift left tools, um, but they're not really working. So what that means is things aren't actually getting fixed by developers. They might be seeing them earlier on in the process, uh, in the development process, um, but they're not actually taking action. And the backlog for the AppSec teams are, they're getting bigger, they're not getting smaller. And so kind of begs the question, is shifting left a useful concept or is it kind of just a buzzword? Um, the answer is it's it's both, right? Like I think most buzzwords are grounded in some truth, but as the term kind of becomes more of a marketing term and gets flanderized, a lot of the nuance kind of gets stripped away. And so I, I would say that at this point, the meaning of the term shift left has been overly generalized to the point where it's sometimes not a very useful statement on its own. Um, this is pretty crazy to me because it, it is at the core, it's a very, very simple concept, but we still somehow managed to overly generalize it for marketing use. Um, next slide, Chris. Thank you. Um, so first we want to kind of go over what shifting left isn't um, from our perspective. And so shifting left is not just bringing issues to developers early. This is definitely one part of the equation, but it's the easy part. And it's also the very obvious part. Like I think every AppSec team understands like, hey, there's, there's five of us here and there's 500 developers. So you know, if there's any hope of us kind of scaling out what we do with the amount of code that's being shipped, um, you know, developers are, are obviously going to need to be involved somehow. And so uh, you're, you know, you're free to kind of interpret shift left to only mean this first part, bringing issues to developers early. And implicitly, that's kind of the interpretation that most other vendors take, right? So they'll scan your code and they'll have a Jira integration built out and they'll create 100 tickets for, you know, the high severity issues. Um, but uh, we'd really like to emphasize that, uh, you know, if this is the approach you take, it's going to be unproductive at best, at worst, actively harmful to the relationship that you have with your developers as an AppSec team. Um, it's very critical, you know, this relationship is very precious and we want developers to view AppSec teams and also the tools that we use as AppSec teams as assets, not as blockers. Next slide. 
Um, so, like I said, getting issues in front of developers, this is not really the hard part. Um, it's not the hard part for you guys. It's also not the hard part for us, you know, as we build out an AppSec platform. Um, the real challenge for you guys is how do you get developers to actually address and action on the issues you bring to them? And the challenge for us as a vendor is how do we build the features and platform that make this possible? So we need to make taking action on security issues and remediating them as easy as possible for developers. Um, this requires a lot of thoughtfulness on our part and um, a very developer-oriented product philosophy, which we're very lucky to have here at SunGrip. Um, so yeah, again, there's there's lots of tools that'll scan your code, open a bunch of Jira tickets, find vulnerabilities, and you know blow up your developer's inbox. Um, and a lot of teams, you know, really do this. Next slide, please. And and so this is just kind of a very basic visual aid that shows just what I talked about. Um, shifting left is not just scanning code at PR time and then kind of directing everything back towards developers, kind of like this uh, fire hydrant analogy. So if all you need to do to if all you need to do is like kind of check the box of like we have a shift left solution, technically developers are seeing things. Um, you know, there's lots of tools you could use for this. Um, if you actually want your backlog to go down, if you actually want to see continuous improvement in your AppSec program, um, this is not going to cut it. And so if you do kind of take this approach, what you'll notice is developers are going to be habitually ignoring security issues and your backlog will grow and you'll accrue tech debt. And it's it's also kind of the worst type of tech debt where the developers actually have no intention of ever actually going back and addressing these issues. And so they're kind of just in the void on the AppSec side um, in a growing backlog. Next slide, please. Um, so we can zoom out a bit. And one thing I wanna talk about is kind of what we're asking of developers today to kind of give you guys a good picture. Um, I think this is important context. And so um, there's this quote on the screen and the gist of it is, you know, obviously it varies based on you know, your organization, your role, if you're full stack backend, but at the end of the day, Today, we're asking developers to you know, know some combination of frameworks, architectures, build systems, definitely Kubernetes, uh, you know, even some networking, SaaS APIs, it's a lot. And so at the end of this quote here, it says, I just flipped through indeed.com and it's remarkable to see what we're asking of junior and senior developers. It's too much. Um, and so if you're a developer in the audience, I know you're nodding your head. Um, this quote is literally just from someone on Reddit and had like 500 upvotes and resonated with me, clearly resonates with a lot of people. So I would uh, credit their username, but it was not exactly appropriate for a work webinar. Um, but really, if you think about it, um, it's a lot to be asking developers to be well-versed in security, right? Especially if you think about kind of the average career of a software engineer and especially the influx of engineers over the past 15 years, there are way more junior developers and senior developers. And like, if we really think about what the most common path to a career in software engineering is, it's pretty much, okay, you're an undergrad student, you're studying computer science, you do the whole recruiting thing, you work for a fang company or you know another tech company, um, you get promoted, you're now a software engineer too, maybe you're a senior software engineer. You're doing really cool things at really big companies. Um, and you know, these developers, the stuff they're building touches millions of people's lives every day. Um, and your scope of responsibility continues to increase. And software engineering is also a very strategic role. It's a lot more than just coding. And so when you think about it throughout this entire process, education and career, at what point are people ever, you know, learning about secure design and secure coding? Um, there's not really time for that to happen. And so it's really unreasonable for us to expect junior or even senior developers to have this kind of corpus of understanding when it comes to secure coding. Um, now, that doesn't mean that developers can't learn and it doesn't mean they can't upskill, but it has to be a gradual process. Um, and this is OK, right? because developers like to learn. They love problem solving. It just has to be incremental. You cannot expect this body of knowledge to just exist from day one. Next slide. Um, okay, so we've established developers have a lot on their plate, cannot expect them to be experts in secure design. This is okay. This just means that our AppSec programs have to be designed with all of this in mind. And so one point that I really want to hit home is that developers will happily fix security issues if the ROI is clear to them. And so what do we mean when we say ROI? Um, questions that a developer will kind of think is, you know, how much time is it going to take for me to address this security issue? 
And is it worth the opportunity cost of this time? Like how much more could I have gotten done, right? And so it's not that developers don't care about shipping secure code. Every developer cares about the quality of their output. Um, I mean, not every developer, but you know, every developer with their salt cares about the quality of their work and their output. And this definitely includes security, right? But the reality is the priority zero for every software engineer at any organization is 99% of the time it's gonna be shipping code and hitting the release dates that they need to hit. And so this is what they're measuring that opportunity cost against, right? This is kind of what you are uh, kind of going up against as an AppSec team. And so the hard truth is that if your developers aren't fixing issues because you know maybe in their mind it's gonna take them an hour and all that's gonna happen is they're gonna confirm that, oh, this issue is a false positive. Um, the hard truth is like I would argue that they're actually making the right call by ignoring the issue. It's like in line with the organization's objectives, right? So if you're not seeing developers engage with security findings, um, it means that the AppSec processes you have in place and the tools you have in place, you're not giving them enough to work with. And so really the key here is we have to be bringing security issues to developers in more actionable and less ambiguous and noisy ways. Um, and once you do this, you'll start to see things improve. Um, and this can take a little bit of time because trust and goodwill definitely takes a lot of time to learn. Um, it also doesn't take a lot of time to lose. And so, uh, you know, as you start to incorporate some learnings about shifting left and um, kind of lowering the cognitive load of solving um, or addressing security issues, try to be communicative about it and let your developers know like, hey, we're trying. Um, by the way, a great way to do this is to say, hey, we just got this new security tool. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, and so I'll hand things off to Kyle here to kind of actually dive into our platform and show a little bit of how we do things. Sweet. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking about the developer experience with SimGrip. And so, you know, you may have worked with other security products in, in the past or maybe even currently, and the developer experience may not exist at all or if it does exist, developers may use it once and, and absolutely hate it and tell you, hey, like, I'm not gonna trust you with any future recommendations because that thing you made me download was just an absolute nightmare. So that's something that we, we take very seriously and wanna create a strong developer experience when they're using SimGrip. And so the typical developer workflow looks something like this. You know, they write code, they commit code locally, and they push it and make a PR that code eventually gets merged and then it's deployed to a live server. And so most security products are going to be targeting after the code is merged and when it's built and pushed to production or maybe during CI CD when the dev pushes and makes a PR. Um, really with shifting left, we wanna get as early on in that process as remotely possible, which would be of course in the actual IDE. So we have a VS code integration as well as IntelliJ in integration and then some developers may even want to use the CLI solution where they can actually run these scans before they even make the commit locally. And so they can use both our out of box and custom rules. So if, if you're a fan of guardrails, another buzzword, but if, if you've heard of guardrails and you're a big advocate for them, you know, you can write custom rules and deploy them throughout your organization. So developers, as they're writing code in their VS code IDE, the code, the lines of code will actually get highlighted and give them recommendations on how to make their code more secure. So that's that's about as early on as you could possibly get. And this really is just to avoid the the ultimate pain point where developers go through this whole workflow only to find out like, hey, you know, hours later the security tool ran and we have a vulnerability. Now we have to go back to square one. Uh, this also is majorly important when blocking is considered or maybe you have license compliance requirements. If a developer gets all the way to the end of this workflow, only to find out that they're using a dependency that has a, a license that they're not authorized to use, they may have to rework their entire PR, uh, which could be a major pain. And so if they are going to be using the CICD integration, you know, they will get pretty robust PR comments when it comes to the pro rules. So as you can see here, this is SimGrip bot giving a PR comment for a, a likely vulnerability. And we give everything from a summarization of what the vulnerability is, what the potential risks are, 
as well as the data flow graph. So you can see what the source, where it might, might be tainted and what the ultimate destination of that source is, where the vulnerability lies. Then you can also see in the PR comment using the assistant guidance and auto fix, you know, we make a, a very detailed argument for why this vulnerability is important. And AI will give you even further at information such as, you know, is there a possibility that there might be infrastructure changes required or is it just a simple code fix? Uh, and, it, and it uses large language models to ultimately come up with that. I'm far from an AI expert. I'm, I will happily admit that, um, but something that I appreciate about the assistant in its PR comments is that it's not afraid to tell you if it's likely a false positive. Um, and so developers seem to appreciate that as well, because at the end of the day, using SAST, there are gonna be limitations. And so we're, we're trying to make the best triage experience. We're not here to tell you that every finding is gonna be a true positive. We want developers to be able to proactively say, is this likely a, a true positive, a false positive? Should we commit the suggestion based on the auto fix? Uh, does the assistant provide additional guidance that maybe we should take into consideration? Or you know, is, do we just say, hey, this is safe to ignore? And so looking closer here at the, the auto fix, you can see that you know, it noticed that the SQLized query is using a parameterized input and it makes a suggestion to make that uh, not vulnerable to SQL injection. Pretty straightforward. The developer can quickly just hit commit suggestion if they feel that the, the fix is appropriate. And then that fix gets merged right into the PR. So within the CICD, they, they identify that there's a potential vulnerability, we're able to triage it, and we're able to commit the auto fix without ever having to leave. Um, yes, yeah, so I can speak on the slide. Um, so customers with assistant enabled have two times the fix rate of those without. So all the issues that developers see, they're fixing twice as many. A um, couple things that I want to emphasize about assistant is that the fixes are quick for developers to verify and approve. So with any generative solution um, or any generative add-on to like a SaaS tool or a SaaS solution, it's very important to note that, you know, just because a recommendation isn't 100% correct, it still gets you 90% of the way there. And so the main value add is that we have this remediation guidance that humans almost always agree with. 96.65% um, of the time humans agree with our auto triage feedback. Um, and it allows devs to not have to do a lot of self-directed research, which is where a ton of the cognitive load and burden comes from. Um, during remediation workflows. So they won't have to flip the chat GPT, stack overflow, do some Google searches. We're gonna give all the information um, that they need to feel comfortable actioning and making a decision on and feeling confident in that decision on um, during remediation. We're gonna give that all to them directly in their PR comment in the most condensed form possible. Uh, next slide. Um, and so this is just a um, image of what our VS Code and IntelliJ ex um, extension looks like. I believe it's supposed to be animated, but that is not coming through, um, but that's okay. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so I, oh, think it's, I, I can just speak to the, the GIF ultimately, you know, it would highlight the, the, the area of the code that is potentially vulnerable. And then it would prompt you with a, a brief description of what the vulnerability is. And it'll even provide the auto fix if one is available in the IDE integration. So you can make that change similar to VS Code when it uh, identifies a syntax error and you can just auto fix it. Same concept applies. Um, I just want to answer Chuck's question real quick. So like I said, our engine is very, very fast. Um, it runs at every keystroke. So it's it's you can kind of think of it as like security or SAS at like the speed of linting. Um, could you go one more slide forward? All right, cool. So this is what the main dashboard looks like in SunGrip. Um, you can see that fix rate as a metric is very front and center on the right-hand side. And so um, we're really designing things around fix rate being kind of a North Star metric for your AppSec program. So fix rate is just measuring the percentage of issues that are being fixed by developers out of all of the issues that you choose to surface to them. This is very important. Um, it's out of the issues that you are choosing to bring to developers. And one of our biggest differentiators as a platform is 
the ability to set rule behavior and really have like fine grained control over, okay, for these rules, we want to bring them to developers for these rules. We don't because maybe they're a little too noisy, but they're still very necessary because um, we want to have comprehensive coverage. And so um, fine, grain, fine grain control over which rules bring findings to developers and where um, is huge. Um, the default rule behavior is to be in monitor mode. So monitor mode means that developers will not see the finding. Only the AppSec folks and the people who are actually in the SEMGRIP platform will be able to see the finding. As you kind of become more confident in rules and you look over the findings, you can move them or promote them. Uh, we like to call it promoting. Uh, you can promote these rules to comment mode. So rules in comment mode will leave a PR comment like the ones that Kyle just demonstrated. Um, and you can even take that a step further for um, certain rules. Uh, we see this a lot with custom rules where if you've written some rule to enforce some specific internal policy, you can actually put this rule into blocking mode, which is a step above comment mode and it'll actually um, fail to CI check and prevent the PR from being merged until the issue is fixed. Uh, next slide, please. So um, some grip rules are very, very easy to understand. Um, this is a huge, huge selling point um, of our platform. They're very easy to understand and they're very easy to customize. And so our rules look like source code. You don't need to learn any domain specific languages to understand them. And also a benefit of this is developers can easily kind of um, intuit about them as well to help with remediation and triage. And also LLMs, if there's one thing that we know about large language models and AI, they're good at understanding source code and reasoning about source code. So um, a lot of SaaS tools will have um, IDE integrations that, you know, um, kind of ping an LLM to generate an autofix. Our differentiation is that we're feeding the rule to the LLM as well, and our rules look like source code again. So LLMs have kind of a lot more information to reason about and come to the right conclusion. Um, and so when you look at this rule up top, all of that is just the rule metadata. You can see the message, which is in that PR comment that Kyle showed us, um, you can actually customize the message that you want developers to see in the PR comments. So say you've written some custom rule that's for um, you know, some internal practice, um, or library that you want developers to use, you can easily customize that rule message and just tell developers exactly, um, you know, why uh, you are enforcing this policy, what the policy is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then in orange, you can see the actual pattern matching logic. And so um, this is a very basic example of a rule, by the way. So our syntax is very robust, um, but just for demonstration purposes, we've used this rule. Next slide. Um, so again, here you can see the three modes that you can put rules in. You've got monitor, where developers won't see them. Comment, where we'll um, leave a PR comment with assistant autofix guidance and um, an autofix suggestion. Um, and our autofix suggestions, like Kyle said, they can be generated by LLMs, but you can also just set a deterministic autofix that will um, do like a find and replace for the code um, for specific instances that you see a lot. Um, and then we have blocking mode, which again, will just block the PR from being merged. Um, and so this workflow on the left just really illustrates the very, very simple process of um, increasing the amount of issues that you automatically bring to developers over time as you become more confident in rules. So shifting left is a process. If you get a tool and immediately, you know, automatically service everything to developers, whether it's via PR comments or Jira tickets, um, you know, like I mentioned, it checks the box of, of shifting left, but it's, it's not actually going to get much done. It's not going to be very productive. And again, at worst, it's it's going to hurt the relationship and the goodwill you have between um, yourself as an AppSec person and your developers. Um, next slide, please. Um, one more. So now we're going to go over uh, some grep code, which is our SaaS tool. Cool. So um, yeah, we didn't want to show too many testimonials or customer logos in this webinar because um, you guys know where to find all that stuff. It's on our marketing website. Um, but really quickly, we wanted to touch on pro rules here and, and show a testimonial um, because uh, it can be kind of hard to communicate the differentiation when it comes to SaaS rules. Everyone has a security research team. They're saying that the rules are the best. And so really from our perspective, what makes our rules different is the underlying philosophy behind them that kind of aligns with everything we've been talking about so far. So we write pro rules to be high confidence and high signal. And we want you to put them in comment mode even right away and feel confident and good about showing them to developers and not worry that you're going to be annoying them or inundating them with false positives. So 
Um, we also have pro rules that are not as high confidence, and these are designed to uncover, you know, deeper, more critical vulnerabilities um, that, you know, potentially um, will have some false positives alongside. And so our, all of our pro rules are labeled by confidence rating. So it's really easy to filter for confidence rating and then use that when you're um, orchestrating orchestrating our product and setting policies for different rules and different types of vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. Um, so definitely we will not have time to get into everything about SunGrip code, um, our SaaS product, but here are just some of the ways that make um, our tool very differentiated in the market. Um, and so one of the main things is that every SaaS tool available in the public market is generalized in some way to work well or okay for every code base, but it's never optimized for any one specific code base. Now, you have a lot of tools that there's no way to actually improve that baseline out of the box performance to one that is more optimal to your specific situation. Um, in other cases, you have tools that do make it possible to do some customizations, but it's incredibly resource intensive, requires um, a lot of upskilling and learning of domain specific languages. Um, and these tools also tend to be slower and they don't run on source code. And so SunGrip is very different in the sense that we work great out of the box. Um, like I just covered, all those pro rules are designed to work out of the box and surface high signal, high confidence results. But we also make it really, really easy for you guys to do um, kind of what I like to call like those last mile customization or tweaks to rules. So you can get kind of the optimal accuracy, like the most accurate solution possible for your code base. Um, and this doesn't require the cost of some super sophisticated, you know, completely custom built in-house SaaS solution that you guys have um, created internally. Next slide, please. Um, the, the other differentiator I wanted to cover was just coverage. Um, if you remember in, in the first slide, you know, all three of our products are powered by the same underlying um, core analysis engine. And so since everything is powered by one engine um, and it's a very performant engine, it's really, really easy for us to scale out language support. And our goal is to support every major programming language and framework used by developers. So um, as an AppSec team, you guys will never have to have a bunch of different point solutions under your jur jurisdiction um, because developers always want best in class tooling. And so we really want to be able to accommodate all of the tech and all the languages and frameworks that your developers are comfortable working in um, without you having to kind of evaluate and acquire a bunch of different point solutions, whether or not they're commercial or open source. Next slide, please. Um, and then the last differentiator, which we've already touched on, it's just crazy fast. Our engine um, only runs on source code and only requires source code, um, even for compiled languages. So there's never any build steps. Um, the median customer scan time is 21 seconds. Um, and it's also very portable. So SunGrip runs anywhere. It can run in your editor. It can run in CI, local. Um, you can also run SunGrip scans in our cloud infrastructure. So, you know, one thing a lot of AppSec teams struggle with is they want to scale out, you know, a good SaaS tool across all of their repos, but there's a lot of red tape they have to climb around because generally AppSec teams um, don't own CI. And so, um, we talked to some customers and they're like, it takes us two weeks to, you know, update the Jenkins file to accommodate this repo. Um, so if you choose to scan in our cloud, we'll scan all of your code for you, delete it right after, and just um, give you the results directly in our platform. Next slide, please. Uh, one more. So now we're going over SunGrip Secrets, which is our secret scanning solution. Um, what makes our secret scanning solution different? Uh, there are a couple of things. So the first one is semantic analysis. So going back again, one engine powering all three products, semantic analysis um, is kind of our secret sauce and it uses our SAS engine to kind of reason about your code to better detect um, false positives and increase the amount of true positives detected. And so uh, overall, if you look at how we detect secrets, we do do entropy analysis and basic regex, which is kind of what puts us at parity with the other um, competitors out there. But we go a step further with the semantic analysis. Next slide, please. Um, and so validation is another big differentiator. Um, we actually, any secrets we detect, we'll validate them to detect if they are uh, like, quote, live. And so, um, for example, if some grep identifies a Slack API key, we'll make a safe call to the Slack API. This happens locally within your infrastructure. So, um, you know, we don't send the secret to our servers at any point. Um, and this is great because we also support 
you know, like I said, same engine, same underlying rules. So our secrets rules, um, you can customize just like our SAS rules and custom validator rules are very, very easy to write. And they'll, what they'll let you do is search for secrets and scan for secrets for any internal services you guys might have or custom subdomains um, or just services that we don't support yet. Although um, it's very, very easy for us to quickly ramp up and scale the amount of um, services that we do support validation for. Um, and so obviously just validating that a secret is active really, really helps you with prioritization. Next slide, please. Um, and yeah, this is just kind of an overview of what our platform looks like on the secret side of things. Um, and it's a very consistent UI across secrets, code, and supply chain. Um, and so now, uh, next slide, and I'll hand it off to Kyle, who is our expert in supply chain reachability, all things reachability. Sweet. Yeah, so if you've been wondering why I'm here, uh, this is pretty much it. <laughs> Some group <laughs> supply chain is uh, kind of, it, or it is literally my baby. I'm a bit of a bit obsessed with just supply chain as a whole, not, not just some group supply chain. So feel free to throw any questions in the chat. But yes, we will be going over reachability uh, at a high level. And so some group supply chain really consists currently of four main features. So we have data flow reachability, dependency search, license compliance, and S um, export. So data flow reachability you know, we talked about shifting left being a buzzword. Well, in the supply chain space, reachability is the, the latest and greatest buzzword for sure. And so there's many different kinds, not all reachability is created equal. And so what we're kind of coining the term for is data flow reachability, where we're not just looking to see, is the dependency imported in your project? No, like that, we, we are looking for that, but how much more can we do? Well, is the vulnerable function associated with the vulnerability and the package called in your project? Yes, okay. Oftentimes that'll, that'll be good enough to determine reachability, but using the SimGrip engine, we can actually take it a step further and say, what data flows to that vulnerable function? Is there a specific parameter that has to be enabled or maybe set to a specific value in order for that vulnerable function to actually be exploitable? If so, we can write our SimGrip rules to actually detect that, which is a, a major limitation that a lot of our competitors have because they're simply using call graph analysis. On the dependency search side, you know, this has been really important, especially, you know, every, every year we get a handful of majorly impactful vulnerabilities associated with dependencies. So maybe think, think log4j. So in, with dependency search, you have a, an easy way to query for the dependency and their a specific dependency and their versions throughout your entire organization or within a, a, a specific project. And so that, that really just makes it really quick and easy to say, hey, you know, this vulnerability is so severe. I don't really care if it's reachable or not. I just want to get it out. Or maybe it's a, a policy requirement. Now you can quickly just search where that dependency is being used and you can rip it out, update it, whatever you got to do. And then with license compliance, this is, this is continuing to grow in importance. Uh, but there's oftentimes policies at organizations that restrict what licenses associated with your dependencies you're allowed to use. And so with license compliance, we can we can both block and allow different licenses based on your policies. So you can fine tune that and say, hey, you know, MIT licenses are all good, but you know, we don't want to allow name name whatever license you want. And when a, a developer goes to create a PR with that license a dependency using that license, then grip will say, hey, you're not allowed to use that. We're not we're not allowing this this PR to go through. And then SBOM, the software bill of material, uh, being able to export an SBOM using SEMGRIP is gonna be more impactful in the future, I would say. You know, SBOMs have questionable value to date just because there's so many in inconsistencies with how they're being created and uh, inaccuracies. You know, maybe you used a different tool to generate the SBOM so you got different results. Um, but we do support the Cyclone DX formatting. So that seems to be the, the winner as of late. So, yeah. Oh, and the SBOM does include uh, metadata about maybe if the, the vulnerability is reachable. So if you're providing these SBOMs to your customers or users of your software, and they're actually assessing these SBOMs, which not many people are doing yet, but if they are, 
they can see which vulnerabilities are likely reachable, which are likely then more impactful than those that are unreachable. And so how are we doing that? Well, software composition analysis has been around for ages and it honestly has a horrible reputation. But that's largely because historically we've just relied on manifest files for SEA. So if you're a JavaScript developer, you're likely familiar with a package.json, that would be your manifest. So it includes all the open source components or the direct open source components that make up your project. Then you can take it a step further and look at the lock file. So that would be your, your package uh, package dash lock. Uh, well, it has lock in the name. It slipped my mind. I have to support six different ecosystems. But anyway, the lock file contains both direct and transitive dependencies. And so that takes things a step further. So you can look at what dependencies of your dependencies are used by your project. But with SEMGRIP, we're using a combination of manifest lock file and also static analysis, which enables that reachability component. And of course, there is also dynamic analysis. However, that adds complexity in the sense that you, you wouldn't be able to be as developer first or, or be able to shift left as much if you were to incorporate a dynamic analysis solution. And so with reachability analysis, I mean, it, it's been proven time and time again. There's numerous studies that look at reachability analysis, primarily using call graph based analysis. So SEMGRIP ideally should be even more specific than the call graph, call graph analysis reachability would be. Um, but looking at this study, you know, there were 932 vulnerable packages, but on less than 12 of them, or I believe it was exactly 12 of them, were actually vulnerable packages that were reachable in the code. So you can imagine if you, if you can cut down your vulnerabilities in the supply chain space to 10% of what the legacy SEA tools are spitting out at you, that might actually make it manageable. Uh, depending on your code base size, it still might not be manageable, and there's other method methodologies for prioritization, but reachability is definitely making the biggest impact. And so how do we write these reachability rules? Well, we have a, a team of security researchers, I'm one of them, and so for all of the latest and greatest at security advisories impacting open source dependencies, our researchers review that advisory. We dissect it, we look at the, the fixed PRs, we look to understand what made it vulnerable in the first place, and we look to see if there's opportunity for where we can determine, identify where it's not relevant. So what, in what cases is this vulnerability not relevant to your project? And then based on that, we write a SEMGRIP rule using the patterns to identify the specific cases where it would be vulnerable. And so you can see here this example, there was a, a package signed XML, and versions before 1.1.0 were vulnerable to improper verification of cryptographic signature. And then we have a brief description saying parsing raw XML can result in different output than parsing the uh, canonicalized XML. I have no idea if I pronounced that right. That's besides the point. And so using SEMGREP, we wrote a pattern here that looks for both the, the import statement of signed XML. And then because that's a pattern inside, we're then gonna look at the remainder of the code and we have another pattern inside, which is looking for the initialization of a new validator. And then we use meta variables to declare what the validator is. And we wrote a pattern to say, hey, is that validator ever calling the validate function? Because we know based on our review of this vulnerability, that is the actual validate function itself, not the, not the class of new validator, not the import of the project, but actually calling the validate function that makes it a worthy vulnerability for you to, to care about. And what's really nice with SEMGRIP's reachability, because we're using static analysis, we're not just going to tell you, hey, you know, here's a call graph of what calls the vulnerable function. We actually give you the specific lines of code with a reference. So when you're looking at the vulnerability or the finding, you can just say, hey, you know, line 27 in this file is calling the validate function. Let me click on it. And now your developer or your security engineers can very quickly say, oh, uh, yeah, you know, actually, this this does look vulnerable. Or, hey, th I think this is a false positive because it's a constant that's being passed to validate. So we can quickly triage it. So that, that makes it a lovely developer experience, in my opinion. And so, yeah, as Chushi mentioned, you know, there's really one powerful engine that's powering all three of these products. 
in addition to SEMGRIP Assistant. So what what's really nice is that SEMGRIP Pro Engine enables a lot more than what we're currently doing with it, and we're constantly expanding on the, the use cases. Um, and there's a lot more we can do with it even across these three products. And so it's just really nice to see, you know, or really think about what future opportunities there are. And I think especially in the, in the supply chain space, if I'm being, um, if I'm playing favorites, there, there's definitely a lot more that can be done. Hopefully get SCA out of that bad reputation it has thanks to legacy tools. Thank <music> you.